Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a grand solar minimum update Thursday, September 19th, 9.30 a.m. Mountain Time, 2024. A large tropical disturbance will develop in the coming days and may result in a large hurricane forming in the Gulf of Mexico this week. Take a look. Could be landfall on the Gulf states in just about a week. Keep calm. It's boom time. We did have some technical difficulties last night. We apologize. The video we produced, well, it's absolutely missing, so we're redoing it now for you. Rare September snow dusts the eastern Sierras and more, including Utah. Utahans rejoicing as a taste of winter arrives before fall even begins. Remember, folks, it's still summer. And Al Gore is still in his hole. The first snow of the season, Utah's snow-capped mountains start their return for winter. Take a look at some of these shots here. The long Utah summer days are slowly coming to an end, and the change of season was signaled on Tuesday morning as Alta Ski Area revealed the state's snow-capped mountains are returning. And lightning is increasing as predicted. 100 strikes in five minutes. Rapid fire lightning hits a popular Colorado trail just a day after we got out of town. This is in Crestone, Colorado the other day. The day after we left the Crestone Energy Fair. A popular trail got hammered. According to the National Weather Service, more than 100 cloud-to-ground lightning flashes occurred in a five-minute time period in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. To put that in perspective, it's about 20 per minute or one lightning strike every three seconds. More specifically, the incident took place just east of Crestone in the same general area as Willow Creek Trail, which leads to the 14,167-foot Kit Carson Peak. And, well, what a tweak. And Leah and I were staying right below Kit Carson Peak for the entire weekend. Lightning leads to wildfires, and a quick look at the smoke map shows that, well, the west is the best. There is no smoke in the west. East of the Rocky Mountains is where the snow the smoke is lingering and those Southern California fires that were putting out huge plumes of smoke are now reduced to a very small area, which is good news. So most of the smoke in Southern California has moved out and away and the West has cleared up. Now, as we said at the outset, Caribbean system forecast to slowly take shape by early next week. Forecast models suggest possible development of a low-pressure system moving into the Gulf of Mexico by mid to late next week, and every model run confirming that threat. Before we get to the models, let's take a quick look at the forecast. Severe thunderstorms in the central U.S. today, upper level low over California. Scattered severe thunderstorms are possible today across central and eastern Minnesota, Iowa, and western Wisconsin. A few tornadoes, isolated, very large hail, damaging winds may occur. An upper level low will help trigger scattered thunderstorms over portions of central and southern California today, along with a few inches of snow in the Sierras as an early winter continues to blanket the region. Shut up, Al! Get your hole! Al Gore is not happy about snow in summer. What a bummer. There is that tropical system that may develop later this week. It's looking pretty good on the models. Other than that, we can take a look at that system to the north today that is bombing out in central Canada. It's going to be bringing a line of thunderstorms on the tail end here to Wisconsin and Minnesota. Say it ain't soda, but it is as it moves east. Overall, low-level threat for severe weather until the end of the weekend here, Sunday, where a huge storm is going to explode over the Four Corners region, bringing high-elevation snow to Colorado and heavy rain and thunderstorms to the eastern plains. A quick look at the GFS total snowfall showing that high-elevation snow over the next six days for the northern mountains in Colorado. Seismic update, low-level activity worldwide, no quakes of note, some interesting uh, quakes happening in the center of the U.S., none of significance, 2.6 in Missouri, and that is followed by a 3.4 in Kansas, probably has to do with the fracking industry.
Worldwide Volcano News. Sabancaya to 22,000 feet, Santa Guito to 13,000 feet, Liwatobi to 10,000 feet, Semaru, 14,000 foot puff and a blast, Bagana on the list with a 12,000 foot puff, Raventador, 15,000 foot, White Island continues its ongoing steam explosion, Bagana puffing with a volcanic plume estimated rising to 12,000 feet, Ibu, 16,000 foot puff, Liwatobi to 10, Semaru to 14, Fuego to 15, Bagana, another 12,000-foot blast. Ibu to 8,000. Raventador, 15,000-foot puff. Sabankai to 22,000-foot. And that wraps up Worldwide Volcano News for the day. Quick look over at space weather. The sun has been completely quiet now over two days. And there are sunspots that are Earth-facing, but there is no flaring happening. Three-day geomagnetic forecast shows all quiet across the globe. Now, let's talk a little space weather. Comet Tuchishan Atlas nears the sun this month. Will it be visible to the naked eye? Well, it is potentially an electric comet. And although at current astrophysics would tell us that if this does grow a tail, it has to do with sublimation of ice, that couldn't be further from the truth. And so we are waiting um, for this comet, for its close approach. Close approach will be on the afternoon of September 27th when it is at perihelion, the closest it is to the sun. The question is, will it break up? Will it illuminate? Well, buckle up and we'll see. Speaking about seeing, NASA's planetary radar spies another peanut-shaped asteroid. And keeping on the electric universe model, the reason that we see these barbell-shaped objects floating around space has to do with electrical scouring. They do have a north and south pole. They do have an energetic electric field. And clearly, there is some type of electrical scouring happening on the equatorial region of these objects. This is not the first, the second, or the third most objects floating around in space in our solar system appear to look like this peanut. Now, the largest jets ever seen in the universe now at 23 million light years long. The Milky Way would be simply a little dot alongside these two giant eruptions, and they're claiming they're coming from a black hole, which supposedly can't emit anything. Here we can see one of those 23 million light-year jets right there. And an artist's representation of what might be going on here. Here is the host galaxy. This is potentially the black hole. Here's a hot spot. And here are the jets. While this picture is nothing more than a fantasy, <laughs> it does hold some truths. In fact, that the host galaxy might represent the central Z-pinch and the jets could be emanating from there. No need for a black hole. What say you? Leave a comment below. All the links will be below the video. Now, a new study suggests that Earth may have had rings like Saturn millions of years ago. Yes, in fact, during the Ordovician. That's quite some time ago, almost a half a billion years ago. And the evidence is in the form of impact craters all lining up on the equator of Earth. The probability of these accidentally all being in the same place at the same time is almost zero. So the study suggests that we once had rings that broke down and rained down on the equator. Here's the paper, which is not coming out for another month. Yes, we travel to the future to bring you the newest science. Evidence suggests that the Earth had a ring in the Ordovician will be linked below. Now NASA plans to launch the Europa Clipper mission, which is going to head out to Jupiter and examine Europa, the icy moon which may harbor life. The only problem is that the Europa Clipper mission is doomed. NASA scientists howl in terror as they discovered a disastrous flaw in the $5 billion spacecraft about to launch next month. Can you believe this? As lead scientist Kurt Niebuhr was informed by urgent email, recent tests revealed that essential transistors in Europa Clipper would be destroyed by Jupiter's intense radiation. Simply put, it would be game over. 
Now, why in the world are they testing these transistors at the end of the build, right before the launch? It's anyone's guess. One of the biggest hurdles in exploring Jupiter is that it's shielded by a monstrous magnetosphere. The magnetic field it contains captures charged particles and accelerates them to ridiculous velocities, forming bands of intense radiation that wreak havoc on electronics. The transistors, which are known as MOSFETs, which stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect, were supposed to be able to withstand this challenge. But tests suddenly revealed they were failing in intense radiation environments. And all of a sudden, the scientists' backs were against the wall. There are around 1,500 of these transistors used throughout the craft. And exactly where was difficult to determine. So let me get this straight. NASA doesn't even know where the transistors are in its satellite? Never a straight answer. I think that NASA and Boeing may be dating. What say you? Leave a comment below. If you haven't heard, Israel detonates Hezbollah walkie-talkies a day after the deadly pager attack, which killed 12 and maimed over 3,000 others. These walkie-talkies packed more explosives, and I don't think anyone holding these to their head made it through. What say you? New warfare is afoot. Is World War III imminent? Leave a comment below and prepare. And that's a boom to knowledge. Please share the video. We are sorry about the technical difficulties last night. We'll make sure to double check that the video is actually the video. Hit the thumbs up. It helps with the Al Gore rhythm. Early winter is coming. I hope you're preparing. Be safe. We love you. And that is a boom. Mm -hmm.